In this video, I want to consider the following question. Are we ever justified in silencing those with whom we disagree? The philosopher J.S. Mill tells us that we're not. His view is that if all mankind minus one were of one opinion, and only one person were of the contrary opinion, mankind would be no more justified in silencing that one person than he, if he had the power, would be justified in silencing mankind. Mill believes that silencing an opinion is like robbing mankind. If the opinion is true, he says, mankind is robbed of the opportunity of exchanging error for truth, whereas if the opinion is false, mankind is robbed of the opportunity of a better understanding of the truth through its collision with error. In this video, we'll spend some time looking at Mill's arguments in favour of freedom of expression. We'll then go on to consider two further questions that Mill asks about freedom of expression. And in the end, we'll summarise Mill's arguments about freedom of expression. So let's move on to the first section and consider Mill's three arguments in favour of freedom of expression. So, argument one, and this we'll call the infallibility argument. Firstly, Mill tells us that to silence an opinion is to assume infallibility. Infallibility is the inability to be wrong. So what Mill effectively is saying is that in trying to silence an opinion, we are assuming that we are absolutely right about the opinions we hold and that the people who hold contrary or different views are mistaken about those. And we're assuming that we can't possibly be wrong about what we believe. Mill tells us that nobody can have such certainty that they can know for sure that such and such an opinion is entirely false. We just can't know things with that amount of certainty. It's always possible that will be mistaken. And there are plenty of examples that bear out Mill's point here. For example, in the past, human beings have believed all sorts of things that have turned out to be wrong. Uh, things like the fact the Earth was flat, the Earth was stationary, the Earth was at the centre of the universe and the Sun revolved around it. Moving on to the next argument, and we'll call this the dead dogma argument, Mill says that it's only discussion and argument that prevent wholly true received opinions atrophying. And by atrophying he means wasting away or declining in effectiveness. The phrase dead dogma comes from Mill himself. He says that if a truth is not fearlessly and frequently discussed, it will be held as dead dogma, not living truth. And what Mill means by this is that it's not nearly enough to just have a belief or an opinion about something. We must know the reasons that we hold that opinion. We must be able to discuss it, to argue for it, to present a tenable defence of it. And that also entails understanding the opposing argument as well. We must, in many ways, understand the opposing argument better than we understand our own argument. Because it's not nearly enough, Mill says, for us to be able to explain and defend our side of the argument, we need to know the other side of it as well. What Mill tells us that is if a person doesn't know the grounds for supposing an opinion to be true, if they cannot make a tenable defence of it against opposition, then they believe the truth only is a superstition and cannot be said to know it at all. Mill then goes on to consider the argument, well, is it really necessary for all persons to know the arguments for and against particular opinions that they hold. Isn't it enough that perhaps a particular elite, perhaps a group of philosophers, if that, as long as they know the arguments, perhaps that's enough? And unsurprisingly, Mill says that's not nearly enough. Each person needs to know the grounds for holding the opinions that they hold. If they defer this to some higher authority, then Mill says they will become easy prey to false prophets. Democracy, he says, will become incompetent and oppressive. Ideas would cease to be vivid and lively, and they would be husks devoid of any real meaning. Mill then asks another question. He says, well, imagine that there is something that all people on the planet are agreed upon, something that nobody disagrees with. Well, what do we do then? Is it enough then we just believe uh, whatever it is to be true? And of course Mill says no it's not. We still need to hold that belief 
uh, vividly. We still need to understand the opposing arguments and we still need to be able to present a tenable defence of it. And Mill says, in these unlikely cases where there are such beliefs that nobody holds the opposite belief, Mill says that we will use skilled uh, devil's advocates who would uh, argue the contrary opinion with, with great passion and vigour and would encourage us to really understand uh, the, the, the reasons that we hold this particular belief that everybody believes to be true. Finally, Mill comes up with what we'll call the insufficiency argument. Most opinions, Mill says, even if they're largely wrong, will contain a portion of the truth. In fact, Mill considers it very unlikely that any opinion, any belief will be entirely true or entirely false. What he thinks is that most beliefs hold some portion of truth. Uh, it may be very small, it may be very large. And what Mill's really getting at here is this the idea that none of my opinions, none of my beliefs are likely to be entirely true. And through discussion and debate with people who share, who have different views, Actually, I can come to much better understand my own view, but I can also refine that view. I can improve it by taking the partial truth that is my opinion, by taking the partial truth that is uh, the opposite opinion or a different opinion. Actually, we can come up with a third opinion that share that has more truth than the two individual components. Truth, Mill says, in the great practical concerns of life is so much a question of the reconciling and the combining of opposites. Now, let's move on to look at two questions that Mill asks about freedom of expression. The first question is, should there be any limits to freedom of expression? And Mill says, actually, yes, just one. And this is what we call the corn dealer's exception. And this is what Mill says in chapter three of On Liberty. An opinion that corn dealers are starvers of the poor or that private property is robbery, ought to be unmolested when simply circulated through the press, but may justly incur punishment when delivered orally to an excited mob assembled before the house of a corn dealer, or when handed out among the same mob in the form of placards. And what Mill is talking about here is clearly incitement to violence, where a particular view is expressed strongly in front of an already angry mob who are suitably armed and roused and in the vicinity of someone to whom they would perhaps quite like to do serious harm, then this is perhaps the only case for Mill where freedom of expression can rightly be limited. Moving on to question two, Mill says, must expression be fair and temperate? By temperate he means showing moderation, self-restraint. What he really means is, does expression have to be polite? Is it okay to cause offence? And surprisingly, Mill says, actually, expression does not necessarily have to be fair and temperate. There are much worse things that we could do. And Mill says, yes, in many cases, it's it's acceptable to cause offence. This, of course, shouldn't be taken to mean that it's desirable to cause offence or that one should set out to do that. But he says that it's not wrong. It's no crime to cause offence. And the reason that Mill feels that it's uh, that expression doesn't have to be fair and temperate is because he thinks that it would be impossible to define the boundaries of what is fair and temperate. Causing offence, he says, is no good guide as opponents will claim to be offended wherever it suits them, normally when they're losing the argument. More than that, he says that actually there are many worse things in arguing than uh, the use of intemperate language. And these are things that the law could never suppress. Things that Mill has in mind here are to uh, suppressing facts, to misstate the elements of the case, to misrepresent the opposite opinion. These could be ad hominem attacks, uh, attacks where we attack the arguer, not the argument. He says even things like you know sarcasm or you know invective, uh, by which he means particularly vicious language. All these things couldn't be suppressed in argument, and in fact these are things that are are much much worse than arguments not being fair and temperate. So, let's sum up Mill's arguments. Here's the major question, the one we began with. uh, Are we ever justified in silencing those with whom we disagree? And we saw that there were three reasons. The first one, which we called the infallibility argument, recognising that we're all capable of error and we may be wrong about things that we believe. The, uh, The dead dogma argument, 
this idea that we need to hold opinions as living truths rather than dead dogma. And it's important for us to engage in discussion with people who have different views in order, if only, just to keep our own views uh, lively, uh, to keep our minds sharp. And thirdly, the insufficiency argument. This idea that even where our opinions are largely true, they are very unlikely to be entirely true and we can improve and refine through interaction with others. And this leads Mill to his conclusion that we are not ever justified in silencing those with whom we disagree, unless, of course, what we say is likely to lead to immediate violence. And then we looked at the minor question of does expression have to be fair and temperate? And Mill presents two reasons to support his conclusion that it is acceptable to cause offence. Uh, the first one being that it's impossible to define the boundaries of what's fair and temperate. The second reason that there are many worse things than the use of intemperate language that could never be prevented. So to sum up Mill's view, it is simply that complete liberty must be granted both of opinion and of the mode of expression. And importantly, it's up to observers to develop the skills to separate the truth of what a person says from the way that it is said. And for very obvious reasons, this has a great relevance to anyone involved in education because, of course, it's going to be in schools and universities where people develop these skills.